Ladies and gentlemen, the world of mountain bikes has evolved a ton in the last decade and whether you are buying your first bike or your 100th bike, it is very confusing and there's a lot to consider and take in. So today we're going to try and demystify all of that. We're gonna go over all of the types of mountain bikes, all of the different wheels and tire size shenanigans, ways to buy and price points, important things to note, and the absolute most important thing, period. All right, different types of mountain bikes. We're gonna break it into three categories and then go a little bit more granular on each one of them. Hardtails, full suspension, and specialty and rare. So to start out with hardtails, there's a number of different types of hardtails. If you're not familiar with the terminology, that is a bike with no suspension in the rear, hardtail, and just front suspension. So. Hardtails, you have dirt jump bikes. Those are pretty rare. I probably could have put those in specialty rare, but they're hardtail bikes. They're made for riding pump tracks, BMX tracks, and of course, dirt jumps and skate parks. Um, the most common mountain bike out there is a cross country bike. So hardtail cross country bike slash general mountain bike. You're typically gonna see about four inches of travel in the front fork, 100 millimeters, four inches of travel. Um, those things go anywhere from like you know, 200 bucks at a department store, all the way to $10,000, depending on the weight, the components, the material of the frame, all of that sort of stuff. So a hardtail is one of the most common bikes out there, and they're typically used for more smooth trails out there, but you can do a lot on a hardtail, and there's probably gonna be a bunch of people in the comments that say, oh, hardtails don't just work for smooth trails. My buddy does, you know, downhill trails and huge rock gardens on it. <laughs> Another person say, oh, I have a friend who uses a downhill bike and rides uphill on it all day. So you can do all sorts of different stuff with mountain bikes, but hardtails, when you're talking that XC sort of general mountain bike hardtail, they're made for kind of like smooth, flowy, um, more just general trails, nothing crazy, but you can have a lot of fun on them and the price points are all over the place. Um, another sort of rare category of hardtails is a free ride hardtail. So that's gonna be something with like 130 to 170 mil travel on the front fork. Um, free ride hardtails are a lot more popular in Canada for some reason and they were a lot more trendy maybe 10 or 15 years ago as kind of this do it all bike um, that you could kind of use as a trail bike and then also kind of use as a downhill bike and also dirt jump it. Um, that's sort of been replaced with a general trail bike these days, but those are your categories of hardtails. Full suspension mountain bikes, you've got suspension in the front and the rear, and I'd break those down as cross country bikes, which are typically four inches of travel, front and rear, 100 millimeters of travel. Um, trail bikes, which generally are like 120 to 130. The lines get blurred all over the place with these different sort of segments of full suspension bikes, but typically a full suspension cross country bike, four inches of travel, trail is about five inches of travel. Enduro would be about six inches of travel, and then free ride and downhill full suspension bikes are about seven seven and eight inches of travel. So the suspension travel does definitely have to do with the type of trails you're riding. The less travel is obviously gonna be more tailored to a bit smoother trails. It's gonna be lighter and faster and made for smoother trails. The more travel you get, the more gnarly stuff you're gonna be doing with it in terms of rock gardens and jumps. Um, and just all sorts of rough terrain. So some of the most popular bikes these days, um, at least in the States, are gonna be trail and enduro bikes. So that's your five and your six inch travel full suspension mountain bikes. The reason those particular bikes are so popular is because they're so versatile. You can ride them quite fastly and efficiently on cross country smooth trails. Um, and you can also still take them because of the geometry and all the components and the good suspension on them. You can take them to a bike park and ride downhill style trails on them. So they're very versatile and that's why people really enjoy those things. And it's what I personally ride all the time as a trail bike um, because it's kind of just that what people like to say one quiver, right? You need one bike and you can do a whole bunch of stuff on it. It works amazingly well for all of those different disciplines of riding. So that's your sort of trail and enduro bike that's really common these days, at least in the upper ends of the price point. So that is your breakdown on full suspension bikes. So last category, special specialty, oh damn it. <sighs> Dang it. So last category, specialty slash rare bikes. Um, there is a lot of different mountain bikes out there. And to talk about some of the more specialty rare ones, the common ones I think in that category are plus bikes. So that could be anything from hardtails, rigid bikes, full suspension bikes of any type that I just mentioned. But plus typically refers to tire size. So that's usually about 2.7 to 3.2 or so. Um, it's a pretty large tire. It gives you a lot more traction and it can be pretty nice for a beginner rider because 
all that additional traction and cushion of those larger tires is pretty nice. So that's what you are typically, when you hear plus bike, it refers to almost any type of bike, most commonly a full suspension or a hardtail um, trail or cross country bike, but it's just a larger tire. A fat bike is an even larger tire. So that's a four to five inch tire. Um, those things are almost always used in the snow. Um, they're great year round bikes. They're really popular in the Midwest where you have snowmobile trails that you can ride on in the winter time. Um, and that's just a cool, fun, interesting segment of bikes, but it's not super common. It's a bit more of a niche you could say. Um, but if you Google fat bike, that's what you're gonna see. Um, last one is e-bike. So e-bike, electric bicycle, um, that is a electric motor that pedal assists you. Um, that's becoming a lot less and less rare. Uh, they're getting a lot more common these days. It's pretty cool to see a lot more riders that wouldn't traditionally like the sport of mountain biking or think that it's too aerobically demanding and then they hop on an e-bike and they can soar like their Lance Armstrong and, and really enjoy the sport. So e-bikes, again, those are typically gonna be on hardtails or full suspension, sort of XC and trail bikes, but there is some enduro style e-bikes as well. Um, but e-bike is just an electric powered bike. So there's your categories of specialty and rare. Before we go into the next chapter of wheel sizes and tire shenanigans, make sure to hit that subscribe button if you like mountain bikes. And uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Back in the day, all mountain bikes had 26 inch wheels. That's the outer diameter of the wheel. Then things evolved. Um, then we got 29 inch mountain bikes. So that's a 29 inch outer diameter wheel. Um, they originally were made for just kind of cross country bikes. Um, there was a lot of advantages to them, especially because it's that larger diameter wheel. And it was really nice for rigid bikes, rigid meaning no suspension at all, which is a super rare bike these days, but hardtails and cross country bikes on 29 inch wheels, people really enjoyed. Then 29ers started making their way into all the other segments, full suspension, cross country bikes, trail, enduro, um, and now even downhill bikes. So downhill World Cups are even being won on 29 inch wheels these days. Um, then there's also some mullet bikes where people put a 29 in the front and 27.5 in the rear. Anyways, 26 basically doesn't exist anymore. Stand, it's gone. It exists in sort of a really, really entry level segment that you might see here and there. That's probably under 500 or $1,000 for a complete bike. Um, 26 is more or less dead, they say. I don't believe you. Um, although a lot of people still ride it and have bikes that are 26ers. If you're buying a new modern bike that's you know made in the last few years, you're probably not gonna see a 26 anywhere. Um, you're gonna see 27.5 or 29. So that is a whole nother debate on itself and you can go down the rabbit hole of 27.5 versus 29. My take on it, um, 27.5, it's a little bit smaller wheel so it can feel a little bit more agile and a little more fun and flickable to ride. Um, 29 has seems like it has a bit more traction. It's good at rolling over stuff and it rolls fast. And for me, I ride a trail bike. I prefer a 29er, I really enjoy that. Some people like 27.5, they like the playful feeling of it and they really prefer that. Um, so there is no right or wrong there. Just kind of depends on what you like and it's also really good to just test those things out. So 27.5 and 29 are going to be the two common wheel sizes you're going to see on modern day mountain bikes. Um, some other shenanigans that we brief, briefly touched on before, plus bikes. So those are going to come most often in 27.5 but there is some 29 plus bikes as well. So that's just a bit fatter of a tire. So most mountain bikes um, going from XC are gonna start at like a 2.0, 2.1 tire, um, going all the way to like a 2.5 maybe on an enduro bike. Plus bikes are typically 2.8 to like 3.2. Um, could be 27.5, could be 29. That's a bit more rare. Again, it offers a bit more traction and cushion, which is really nice for a beginner rider, um, but can also kind of feel like rolly and wobbly and a little bit heavier, so more advanced riders might not favor it. Um, again, that's a more niche segment. Fat bikes, again, are still one of the rare things that are kind of commonly using 26 inch tires still, um, because it's when you have a you know four or five inch wide big fat tire, uh, 26 inch is probably comparable in terms of diameter of the wheel. Um, so yeah, that's a whole fat bike category, but again, that's a more specialty rare category. So that is wheel size shenanigans. Feel free to dive into the 27.5 versus 29 debate. Um, there's no answer to that. That's right or wrong. If anyone says so, they're blowing smoke. They're both really fun. They just have different characteristics. There are a lot of different methods to purchasing a mountain bike and 
to me, I always like to steer people to the method of bike purchase that makes sense for sort of their bike knowledge. And what I mean by that is if um, you're kind of a novice to the sport and you prefer to have a professional work on your bike all the time and take care of it for you and all that sort of stuff, a local bike shop is a great way to buy a mount bike. So find a local shop near you, go in there, hopefully you can find a good one that gives you good customer support and get an awesome bike and you can constantly take it back there, they can work on it and do all the maintenance for it. Um, so you don't have to worry about it. If you are further down the rabbit hole of the mountain bike world and you like to sort of work on stuff yourself or maybe you have a good friend who can work on it for you or you really do enjoy watching YouTube videos and learning about this stuff, um, buying a used bike is a great option as well. So buying a used bike, um, Pink Bike is a big website in the mountain bike world that you probably know of. They have a buy sell form where it's kind of just um, like a Craigslist style thing where people post higher end mountain bikes and you can just buy and sell. There's obviously some risk involved in that, so be wary of that. Danger is my middle name. Um, you could buy a used bike on eBay, you could buy one on Craigslist uh, if you want to find something locally. Um, and sometimes local bike shops also have used bikes as well. So that's another uh, route that you can go. Typically if you're buying a used bike, you're not getting it from a shop, so you're going to want to be able to know how to do all your own maintenance. Or hopefully you have a shop that's cool with taking the used bike you bought on Pink Bike or something and doing the service on it. So. Um, Another option, consumer direct bike brands. We recently came out with a video all about those things. So this is a bit new. Traditionally, um, pretty much the only place to buy a complete bike um, was from a retailer, right? A, a local bike shop. Then there was retailers that sold them online. Um, we do both. We have three brick and mortar stores. We also sell complete bikes online, more on that high-end mountain bike segment. Uh, but nowadays you have a lot of options. You can buy sort of the entry level lower end stuff on Amazon, meaning mountain bikes under like $1,000. Um, you can buy consumer direct with brands like YT, Canyon, Commonsol, um, and some other ones that are popping up here and there. Consumer direct is where the bike brand the, who manufactures the product doesn't use a retailer, so they just have it and they have a website and you can buy directly on that website. The bike shows up and you assemble it yourself and ride it and you take care of your own maintenance and all that sort of stuff. So. If you're a pretty knowledgeable mountain biker, Consumer Direct could be a great way to buy a bike. Typically, the reason that model exists is because when you cut out the retailer, you can offer more value to the customer. So say a you know, $3,000 bike from a Consumer Direct brand is gonna have a lot nicer components on it than a $3,000 bike that's sold to you at your local brick and mortar bicycle store. So there's advantages and disadvantages to buying a Consumer Direct brand there. Um, Check out that video if you want to go more in depth of how all of that's evolved and how that's kind of shaken up the industry. And obviously you can imagine consumer direct bike brands are making retailers in the industry very upset. I'm going to throw up. Um, so those are some different ways to buy a bike. Another thing to mention is Velofix is a mobile bike shop service. I think they have close to like 150 mobile sort of units all over the country right now and uh, plenty of them in Canada. That's where they started. Uh, that's a pretty cool service. So if you don't have a bike shop near you or you don't have a bike shop you like, near you um, or you bought a bike from a consumer direct brand sometimes velofix will can deliver it to you and you can utilize them and they have an app and you can schedule service they show up and they work on your bike in your driveway in their van pretty interesting little setup as well so that kind of gives you like that broad overview again it depends on who you are do you like and you know appreciate going into a local store seeing someone face to face having them work and maintain your bike for you um, do you not like that or do you not have that option because there's not one nearby you so you want to buy an online do you have a velofix a lot of different ways to go kind of depends on where you're at in terms of skill level of working and maintaining your own bike and desire to do so as well. At the time we're filming this video in early 2020, some important things to note about all mountain bikes. They have come a very, very long way and in my opinion, it seems like it's hard for them to get much better. They're a bit at like a product innovation plateau, I would say. And what I mean by that is a high-end mountain bike these days is really, really good. Um, and if you were gonna spend, say, you know, three to $10,000 on a bike, uh, $10,000 on a bike right now, she it's not gonna be too much different in terms of like features and stuff um, as it would have been like a 2016 or 2017 bike. Starting around 2016, 2017, we got some really good things. Reliable dropper posts. So that's something uh, that every mountain biker is absolutely in love with and I probably wouldn't even wanna ride my bike if I didn't have one. Um, dropper post, 
thumb actuated remote to lower and raise your seat. It's an amazing feature. You can't buy a mountain bike without them. And around 2017 or so, we started getting really good, reliable ones. They weren't re really reliable prior to that. A lot of people in the mountain bike world know how annoying those things were in the early days when they first came out. But dropper posts are sort of like a keystone aspect of a good mountain bike these days. Um, another thing is a one by drivetrain. What I mean by one by is it's a single chain ring in the front and typically 11 to 12 gears in the back. Um, that way you don't have a front shifter, so you don't have anything to mess with on your left hand, you just have your dropper lever there. Um, no front derailleur, that adds a lot of simplicity to the whole thing, you just have all your gears on one side right there. Um, Shimano and SRAM are the most you know, commonly known drivetrains out there that make one-by systems these days. Um, those are amazing, so dropper post, one-by drivetrain, those are sort of like key things like you just gotta have if you're buying a mountain bike this day and age. Um, and a lot of other advancements have happened in terms of geometry and suspension and stuff, but uh, like I said, I feel like where we're at now with bikes, like 2017 bikes and moving forward are all pretty similar and all really amazing. Prior to that, there was things that we didn't have, like we didn't have as wide of range drivetrain systems, we didn't have reliable dropper posts, we didn't have good geometry, things like that. But if you're buying a bike this day and age, um, 2017 and up, Make sure you're getting a dropper, make sure you're getting a one by post. Um, that's just really important stuff. I didn't even touch on carbon versus aluminum in this video because price points are all over the place. Um, aluminum, carbon, really kind of depends on price point. Carbon's a bit lighter, has a bit of disadvantages if you like smash it with a rock. Does that happen? Probably not. I don't know. I ride a carbon bike, a lot of people do, but I also still ride aluminum here and there. They're super fun. That's a whole nother video. You can dive into that topic if you want. Um, yeah, but those are important things to notice for modern mountain bikes. Before I tell you the most important thing, drop a comment below of what type of bike you have. We'd love to know. But the most important thing is that all mountain bikes are fun. Um, all bikes are fun in general. So because there is a million different types of bikes out there these days, don't get too caught up in decision paralysis and freeze up and stare at the shelf and not know what to do. Um, just try and ride some. If you have buddies, you can ride their bikes. If you have local shops, you can do bike demos. There's a lot of cool bike brands that travel around the country that you can just ride different bikes. Try stuff, test stuff, ride bikes, enjoy yourself, get something in your price point that you're, you can afford right now. Um, go out there, ride it, have a big smile on your face, and remember that riding mountain bikes is about having a ton of fun, and it pretty much ends there. Um, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.